Hey Mark, how's it going man? Let me know if the sound's coming through alright. Luke, Brandon, hey guys. Uh, let's see. Just unloading my pockets right now. Okay. Good deal, good deal. Whoa. Whoa. What the freak is my camera doing? Hold on. What is going on? Okay. So my camera is doing something. I, this is exciting. Um, let me try inserting an SD card in. That was weird. <clears throat> okay. Baby mode. Uh, Alright, so... She's growing a demo. It's back. Yeah, I don't know what that was. I didn't put an SD card in my camera. And I thought, oh, I don't need it. It'll be fine. And apparently it was not fine. So, uh, apparently maybe the SD card in there will keep it happier. Uh, anyways. So, it's um, it's been a couple weeks. Usually I do these things like every two weeks. But, I don't know. Last week, um, I had applied for a new position at work. I didn't get it. I was pretty bummed. Feeling sorry for myself, kind of being a little bee, and so I just didn't really do much last week. And um, <clears throat> anyways, this week getting my life back together, being an adult, adulting, all that other junk. So, yeah. Um, so we'll start out with kind of what I carried today. Now, I am not as organized tonight as I want it to be, but um, a lot of new stuff. I've gotten a lot of new stuff in the last three weeks, so I'll show you guys that. Um, what else? Of course, the uh, Blade HQ, whatever knife they threw in the box, and it's a surprise for everyone. And, uh, and then questions. People asked a lot of questions this time, so um, we'll go through some of that. But, you know, we'll start with what I carried today. Still rocking the uh, Das Alfini, Alfini Mir. I think someone corrected me in my German. It's Das Alfini Mir. Uh, Hobe wallet. Uh, that, that was the last four of my debit cards, so please don't steal what little money I have in there. That's for knives. Um, carry the... which one is this? So this is the... oh my... the Olight M2R Warrior. Uh, pretty freaking big light, but it's nice. It Really good light. <clears throat> and then since I'm all matchy-matchy, right? Got the new ZT0393. The ZT pen that I had blue anodized, my Avig Holdra, and then I still carry a spinner from time to time, and I kind of play with it because um, I talk to a lot of clients at work. I'm on the phone a lot, and sometimes if I'm not spinning something, then I want to strangle someone. So this is probably the safest solution for me. But uh, yeah, <laughs> hippie knife lover said this. Flashlight looks like it's a bitch in the pocket, dude. It's it's big. I mean, there's really no way around it, but it's it's a nice light. Um, three times today, my seatbelt got caught in this secondary part of the clip, and so it like pulled the entire flashlight out of my pocket once, and you know, unattached the clip once, which is kind of good though, because if the clip had not you know just like stripped off, it would have like bent the crap out of it. So that was kind of a nice fail safe today, as you know. My seatbelt yanked the stand in my pocket. So, uh, anyways, um, so Paul asks, no carry gun. So the thing that sucks, Paul, is that in my place of work, if I were to be caught carrying a gun, I would immediately be fired. So when I'm at work or I've just gotten home from work, I don't have a gun on me, which I don't love. But um, it's nice to get a paycheck every two weeks. So, you know, it is what it is. At least I can carry a pocket knife at work. I've talked to the security guard. We talk all the time. He's cool with it. And, you know, if I couldn't carry a pocket knife either, I would probably find a new job. Because, I mean, what would I live for, really? I mean, let's be honest, right? So let's um, move that stuff out of the way. Uh, I'll just put it on the floor. I'm not shoving it back in my pocket. And let's see. I'll let you guys pick. So should we start with the new stuff? 
questions or the Blade HQ knife of the day, you guys vote. You guys vote. So, sit back for a minute here, let the lag between when I say crap and when you guys hear crap and then when you respond kind of all catch up here. And uh, this is what I'm drinking tonight. What is this? Amp Organic Energy Drink. It's uh, it's actually delicious, so. Mm. All right. Um, I'm seeing I'm seeing quite a few responses for the Blade HQ knife. Oh, some for new stuff, mostly for Blade HQ. I think the Blade HQ stuff is going to win out. Uh, you know, I'm more than likely the fact that you guys are staring at their logo the entire time is subconsciously pushing you towards that option, right? Anyone disagree? All right. So I'm gonna again. I don't look at. I don't look at the knives before um, before I open them because that would kind of defeat the purpose of this being fun. So I honestly have no idea what's in the box. You guys know it. You guys love it. The Barney box from Blade HQ. When I was down at Blade HQ today, um, I met a guy who actually watches my videos. Uh, his name was like Connor or something. And he was there buying an Alamic Busker and he, he broke... He made a mistake. He took his wife down to Blade HQ with him, and she saw him buy the knife, and so now she knows how much his knives cost, and that is a no-go. So, pro tip, if you're watching, do not take your wife to Blade HQ. If she asks, eh, it wasn't too much, is always the safe response, so that's a pro tip. Um, <laughs> Corpse Grinder asks, what's in the effing box? I know. I know, I'm teasing. I had to tell you the Blade HQ story. Oh, Second thing, I almost bought the Chris Reeve carbon fiber Manundi down at Blade HQ today, but after handling it and seeing how small it was, I refrained. So God bless Blade HQ, because if I didn't handle it per first in person, I would have absolutely bought that. And even still handling it in person, it was still like a, do I need it? Do I need it? And I decided to be an adult and not buy it today. So anyways, um... <laughs> All right, so let's let's get into it. So we've got the Barney box. We have stole it from Jennifer, who whoever she is, and okay, okay. So it's in some sort of plastic. I hear plastic. Um, here's the spec sheet. We're not going to look just yet. Let's move the Barney box out of the way. So I don't know. Okay, so it's it's in a plastic wrapper. So let's I'm gonna I want to try to feel I want to try to guess it because last time I guessed the Rockstead and I did give that back and that did break my heart, but I guessed it because of the the ray skin inserts. This one I want to try to feel it. See if I can guess it. Huh? It's titanium. It's heavy. Hmm. I have no idea. Oh, there's an opening hole. Feels like a Gavco opening hole. Eh, let's just open it up. Oh, oh, th hello. Hello, hello. It is the Gavco opening hole, kind of, but this is that, the Reich. I'm really glad they put this one in the box. This one has been on my list to check out. God, you guys at Blade HQ are good. Like, I, I, Every time I see a picture, I'm like, oh, yeah, I really want to check that one out. And then I forget about it in, you know, whatever is my day. But uh, it is an integral. And Blade HQ, I think they know how I feel about integral. So this is the Reich Thor 5, looks like right here. But, yeah, this is cool. Well done. This is a fun one to check out. So much machining. Um... Interesting. Well I, well, I mean, right off the bat, I like it. Um, I mean, it, yeah, who wouldn't? So, uh, let's take a look at the spec sheet real quick here. So, here, and she not, she's not cheap. So, there's the Blade HQ item number. So, if you go to their website, you search that, you'll come to this knife. But it's 600 bucks. And... Uh, some of the specs, so blade length of uh, 3.75 here. Thickness, 0.16, so it's M390. It is on bearings, of course. It is a frame lock flipper. 
Uh, it is an integral and it does have a stainless steel lock insert. Uh, apparently it comes with a little little leather sheath or something. I don't know. There's like a little picture of a leather sheath. I don't know what that's about. Um, what's on the second page? Okay. All right, cool. So let's move the spec sheet out of the way. And uh, let's take a look at this one. I mean, right off the bat, I really like it. This machining is insane. I mean, that is some insane machining for an integral bag style clip. Nice little glass breaker here on the butt of the knife. And then that's inset into the handle. I wonder if that's removable. Hmm. Not sure that it is. I don't really see an attachment point from the inside, you know? Um, but yeah, what do you guys think? I mean, oh, look at the skull here. It's fun. This is a fun knife. Like, you know, this is something that you pull out and people think that you're really, really weird, but it brings you a certain sense of joy. Um, Hanna work is top notch too. I don't know if the color is going to come through properly, but um, there is a, a really, really nice anno here. So uh, let me look at the, uh, let me look at the comments. So you guys are upset about the price, understandable. Smooth, um, yeah, it's smooth. It's definitely got some breaking in to do. Um, either that or the detent ball needs a little bit of lubricant on it. I mean, it, it's smooth, but it definitely needs to break in a little bit. Um, yeah, the, the D10 is set up pretty well so that you can use your, you know, use your opening hole there fairly well. So, all right, let me look at some of the comments. <clears throat> 600 bucks doesn't sound very smooth. Alex said, yeah, it needs to break in. I can, I can tell you right off the bat. Um, <laughs> Hippie Knife Lover says, Blade HQ is really taking advantage of the fact that you're willing to buy expensive knives. Yes, yes, they are. Again, I refrained on the Manundi, the Christie of Manundi today. I'm sure that was much to their shock and surprise, but it, I've gotten I've gotten a lot of knives in the last couple weeks. I have so many videos to do. I was just like, oh, I'll wait, you know. Um, okay, so some of you guys are saying maybe, you know, half the price would be more reasonable. <clears throat> Paul said, it doesn't come with a lunchbox, beater knife. Yes, I think that we should, <laughs> we should ask Blade HQ to include Barney lunchboxes if knives are over a certain price. I mean, it's not too much to ask, right? Um, so Koala Pear said that it's not too unreasonable considering the amount of work that went in. Mm, okay, so... Coup blade, my buddy Dave said it looks kind of like a Gavco, and I'd agree. It's it's got some Gavcoy lines here, um, kind of like a Mako, <clears throat> like a Mako style blade, pretty much. Um, you know, which I like, but I don't know how Mike would, you know, Mike Gavco would feel about that. So, um, yeah, but the anno work is so nice. Reich is a really interesting company. I. Uh, like the stuff they do is is pretty far out there. It's really cool. They're really good at machining, but you know they they don't have that established presence of like uh, Wee knives or Riot knives or Kaiser knives. Um, although they are at every freaking knife show, I kid you not. Oh my gosh, I you know based on the number of knives they sell versus the shows they go to, they've got to be in the hole. I don't know if they're selling enough knives to facilitate all the knife shows they go to. Um. Bum, bum, bum. All right, let's see here. What's the thickness? How thick is that blade behind the edge? Well, I was, um, where are my calipers? Where are my calipers? Oh, here they are. Yes. <clears throat> I actually um, remembered to get out my, my uh, drug scale, as you guys have referred to it, and my calipers. So let's turn this on. We're zeroed. And let's go. This thing's got kind of like a a really fine bead blast, so let's let's not scratch it. All 
All right, 0 0.033 inches right behind the edge. And just for reference, the pair two is 0 0.025. So, you know, a little bit thicker behind the edge. And the blade stock per Blade HQ's measurements is uh, 0.16. We'll verify. Uh, yeah, just about 0.16, sure. So, let's make sure I didn't scratch this. If I scratched it, I, I would probably buy it. Um, I wouldn't be mad about that. All right, let's, let's do some up-close stuff. This knife deserves it. Um, so, really, really fine bead blast. You can see they chamfered around the inside of the opening hole. Thor number five. Not sure how I feel about that text with that logo. Um, very different. Uh, I can't. I can't think of words, guys. <laughs> I can't, very different fonts. Oh my gosh. All right. Um, there's some jimping. Oh, that's interesting. The stop bar is actually integral to the piece of titanium. They machined around that to create that stop pin. You know, it's not it's not a pin that's attached, it's just part of the titanium frame. That's cool. That was a fair bit of machine work. Um, another knife that did that is the triple nine, and uh, I think there's another, but you know, the triple nine for sure. Um, so anyways, let's do some up close and then I'll check the comments again. You know, I'm not like the biggest fan of skulls, but sometimes they still make me happy, you know. And then this one has kind of that spine um, going on here. Maybe this is a knife for Dr. Frankie since he did his servo with like a, a spine and a skull. Um, maybe he wants to buy this one. So, but yeah, a lot of machine work, especially in an integral. I don't know. I'm, you know, again, it's it's not the most practical knife. It's not your, it's not a pair of two, but this, it's fun. This is a really fun knife. So, um, let me look at the comments. So, why is the sharpening choil so big? Uh, it takes it right to the end of the frame for your fixed angle system. So, that should make uh, some of you guys happy. Um, I like that the plunge line matches the you know the angle of the frame here. I think that's always a a nice touch. I have a friend who's like super OCD about it. It's like the only thing he comments on. So uh, yeah, yeah, definitely a Mako style blade. But I mean, it looks it looks good overall. I'm I'm digging this knife. Not for any of the right reasons. All for the wrong reasons. So. Yeah, Marco is saying it needs some lube. Yeah, if it was mine, I'd just take my lube and just blast it in there. Well, actually, I do, when I get new knives, I'd like to run them dry for as long as possible. But since I'm like so OCD about seeing how smooth it can get, usually I can only go a couple days and then I hit it with the lubricant of choice. But if you can run them dry, the, the additional friction between like the ceramic and the stainless steel or ceramic and titanium, I feel like... Um, polishes the surfaces faster. When you put lubricant in there right away, it reduces the friction between the materials, and so it'll take longer to hit, you know, optimum smoothness. So, I don't know, it's, you know, again, it's it's hard to not just blast it with lubricant and get a little bit smoother right off the bat. Like, it takes a lot of self-control for me to not do that. So, anyways, um, let's see. Paul says he likes the Leong Ma 15 more. Um, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of the Leong Ma 15. Don't don't get me wrong. It's the Leong Ma 15 has a little bit better flipping action. Um, although I like how this one's angled. Like the detent on this is not very strong, um, but that flipper tab, the way it's shaped, and the you know the fact that it's like slightly in front of the pivot actually gives it a lot of leverage to uh, generate quite a strong flipping action. So, you know, but yeah, this one certainly needs to break in. And I don't mind, um, you know, breaking in knives is, you know, kind of part of the process. It's like breaking in shoes or, you know, breaking in the engine of a new car. It's just something I've used part of the process. So, um, Hippie Knife Lover wants to know if you can baton with this thing. Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. 
you can baton with anything, right? At least for a, a few a few hits. Yeah, so Koala Pear was saying, interesting comment, but uh, Reich Knife is just a passion project for Richard Wu, the owner. He makes he makes most of his money doing OEM work for probably American brands, and so this is just what he does for fun. And I mean, yeah, I, I can see that. I mean, you don't make this on a $600 integral with a skull in the spine because you think it's going to sell well. You make it because it makes you happy and you hope that someone might buy it. Um, yeah, so I, I'd agree with that. Oh, so for life do asked if I had any further info on the Riot Hills. Um, if it really is not in production anymore, we'll go if go get a few spares. Yeah, the the Riot Hills that knife came out like three three years ago maybe, and. They they did a run. They did a large run. It sold really well. It put Riot on the board for a lot of people because at two hundred bucks, like the quality was like mind bogglingly good. Um, but that knife has not been in production for a long time. I have not seen any new ones produced. There may still be a few dealers who have like old new stock, you know, still still there. Um, but I wouldn't get any more than two, you know. And, you know, if you're a knife enthusiast, at some point you're going to sell your backup and pick up a different knife anyway. So, um, but it's a great knife. Um, I I was super impressed with that knife, especially for the price point. These days, it's still a good value. I mean, it's still a great knife. Um, pretty thin blade stock, as I recall. But, yeah, it's been out of production for, for years. And aesthetically, it wasn't their most popular model. But value-wise, it, it definitely was. So, hopefully that helps with that. Um, oh, Corpse Grinder said maybe Dr. Frank would like it too. Yep, yep that's, yep. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> ESB goes in dry. You heard it here. Thanks, Paul. Absolutely. I try to at least, right? Um, okay, let me see. Did they get permission from Beg for the clip? Uh, highly doubt it. Um, Riot, since they work with Beg, they do have permission on the clip, um, and I know that Olamic Cutlery has permission on the clip, um, but not too many of them do. It's it's not trademarked, it's not patented, but typically, you know, uh, companies will ask them for permission, and um, yeah, there are a lot of instances of them not getting permission, and you know, Mark's just kind of like shakes his head. So, anyways, but. Oh, man, this it, this is such a fun knife. It is just, I, yeah, I love it for all the wrong reasons. It's it's really, I'm really enjoying this piece. So, um, all right, let's see. Teflon needs lube right away. Jace one eighty seven says, um, yeah, I'd agree with that. I agree with that. I mean, Teflon, there's. I mean, the services could, in theory, polish from the Teflon over time, but, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. It's nice, but it looks like a larger and angrier hummingbird, Richard said. Okay. I get that. Uh, Dave Misanthropia <clears throat> said, Richard Wu is the knife industry's biggest enigma. I don't know, what about that guy who designs a new knife every single day? What was his, like, you called him ham and cheese or something? Or he does two sun knives or whatever? Isn't that guy more of an enigma? When does he sleep? What does he eat? What's his favorite brand of cocaine? These are the questions. Okay. Mm, and then Dave, <clears throat> he's also Knife Nuts Dave, Misanthropia goes on to say... Um, maybe I'll sell an integral for 600, maybe I'll sell a 1507th carbon fiber inlays wholesale for 175. Reich has zero logic to his price structure. Uh, I can't disagree with that. Their prices have been all over the place. They're, they're kind of crazy. And then, you know, they, I, I think at the shows, if you negotiate, like you can get a better price. So, um, man. All right. How many ballast songs? Uh, I don't have, I have like one super crappy ballast song. Um, 
I just, I, I spent so much time like cutting myself and, you know, now I'm like on a high deductible insurance plan. So if I slice my hand open, I'm going to have to go in and get stitches. I have to pay the deductible and, you know, that's money that I could use for knives. And so I just haven't really done ballast songs in a long time. Although I would be a little girl and get a trainer and freaking love it. But, you know, do I, it's on my to-do list, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So probably because I can't flip for crap and I just look like a dummy. All right, let's see. So, yeah, anyways, let's um, whew, let's look at this one one more time. But, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm not upset about this at all. I, it just uh, it makes the 12-year-old inside of me very excited, you know, because uh, it is well-made. It needs to break in, definitely needs to break in. Um, I wouldn't mind a little bit more detent strength on it, but that might make the other methods of opening slightly more difficult. So, I mean, for... When you've got a flipper tab and an opening hole, you can't optimize action. You have to generalize action so that you can actually use all of the methods, you know. So, again, once it breaks in and gets a little lubricant, um, I think the action will be pretty nice. But, you know, they do the stainless steel lock insert. Um, they have an over-travel stop that's part of the pivot. They do some unique things. Um, their Anno is, is certainly the most complex of any production company, but... Yeah, just that machine work is just out of control. So, centering is good. Um, the glass breaker on the back here, you know, it's it's fairly sharp um, compared to a lot of other glass breakers. So, um, when you hit it, getting it out of your pocket, <laughs> maybe. Just depends on how you grab it, I guess. It's got a little hole here, so you can just grab it like this. But if you're like going in at it and like wrapping your hand around, you're gonna feel that. So I don't know. Maybe you can remove it. I'm not gonna, you know, grab a pair of pliers and start tweaking on anything. One of these pocket clip screws could, in theory, eh, maybe go through and hold that in place. I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm not gonna do any surgery on this. So um, yeah. But I like it overall. It's it's a fun piece. So, <clears throat> okay. Ooh, Carson Tech is a true mystery. Yeah, Carson Tech disappeared and it was replaced by... Um, oh, Dave, it's that knife that you guys all said was fantastic. What's that company now? Um, shoot. I can't think of the name of the company, but... But it's the it's the same designs. It looks like the same company. They're just not using like weird locks and stuff and charging six hundred dollars. So, um, yeah, yeah. The real steel. I'm pretty sure that real steel, Carson Tech became real steel. Like if I had to put money down, I would say that Carson Tech and real steel are the same company because the designs look very similar. They just dropped the prices significantly and stopped using weird locks. So. Um, Yes, that would be my guess, but who knows? All right, so let's, we'll move that here. You guys can ask more questions on that. Some of the new stuff this last week are, of course, the ZTs, right? The 0393 and then the 0462 and, oh, I freaking love this knife. I'm a huge fan of Persians um, and I'm a huge fan of ZT and the execution and everything is just fantastic. And this thing is so smooth. So, you know, I had um, uh, about a month before they announced this knife, I put in a Blade Forms thread that I would definitely buy a larger version of the 0460, right? Um, and then a month later, it was debuted. And I mean, that made me happy as a clown. So, um, sometimes dreams do come true, but yeah, this thing is, uh, I love it. Love it, love it, love it. <clears throat> so let's see. So those were new ZTs I got in the last few weeks here. We'll move those to the side. And of course, Blade HQ is getting in all the new ZTs, so you can always order there. <clears throat> um, many of you guys probably got one of these, but this was an exclusive for Collector Knives, and it's the the Lion Steel Shuffler Jack something clip point M390. Um, 
This thing is gorgeous. This is like the best looking slip joint I've ever seen. I won't call it a traditional knife and get people hot and bothered and upset about things, but um, it is, it's gorgeous. It's really, really nice. Love the materials for 130 bucks. I think that, um, you know, this thing is a steal. So, <clears throat> and then I tacked on one of their $10 slips and it's, um, it's really nice. It seems to be well made. So that's one of the other new things. Um, boom, boom. Oh, Real Steel just licensed a few designs. Hmm, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Again, with the Chinese knife companies, um, it is always a mystery wrapped in an enigma. And then there's more to that phrase, but I don't remember. Okay. Um, let's see. Paul B. said this is the best looking Quaken style Persian flipper. This one is fantastic. Um, another one that's really, really nice in terms of design is, oh, I hate myself. I can't think of any names today. Actually, I just suck at names in general. Um, who designed the mouse? Not the, it was the mouse? For Spider Co. and the Spidey Chef? Who is that? Um, he also has a Persian that is to die for. Um, Someone recall the name for me so I don't have to think. <clears throat> Sleesh? Yeah, Sleesh. Sleesh has, he has a lot of really, really nice designs, but he also has a Persian that I really like, along with a lot of other designs he does that I really like. I really hope ZT picks up something from Sleesh at some point because it's just, I, I think it'd just be money in the bank, you know, but he might be on lockdown with Spyderco to be honest, so who knows. Yeah, Marsh, uh, Marson Sleesh. Um, He's a, he's a freaking amazing designer. So Knife Nuts Dave said, what a coincidence that the Green Thorn Polychotney clone came out right as the 0462 was released. Dude, I am not up on what's going on in the clone market. Dave, you're going to have to educate me at some point. Mm. Bad Rattle wants to know if I'm going to get a Skaha version 2. Um, I'm going to be honest, guys, those Skaha knives, aesthetically, they do not do it for me. Like, I'm sure the fit and the finish is good, and I'm sure that they're really well made, but just, I, I don't like to look at them. They're just not for me. So, yes. Echo does knives. Do the screws show on the inside of the shuffler? On my round head, the screws stuck out and were very close to the blade. Huh. Let's take a look-see. See what we have going on. <clears throat> Okay. Um, so I don't see the screws coming anywhere close to the blade, to be honest. Where's the... So. Hopefully you guys can see. And I, I don't even know if this is streaming in high def. I mean. You know, perhaps it'll render in high def later once it finishes rendering and stuff and, you know, YouTube uploads it as a was live stream. But anyways, no screws um, poking out in here that I can see. So, yeah, this thing is pretty. So, yes, hopefully that answered your question. Um, what's up, Renee? And what's up, Chaz? Is the Thor 6 out yet? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, this is the Thor 5, and I, I think this is, like, a brand new design, you know? Again, he comes out with new designs, like, all the time. It's really hard to keep track of them, but, um, no idea. I would go check Blade HQ's website. If they have the Thor 6, that means that it's out. If they don't, then it's not. Man, I, I don't know if this is going to show, but... Just the anna work and kind of the texturizing on this thing is really nice. Um, I'll, I'll post some pictures to Instagram, hopefully in like high def, um, that kind of show like the anna work on this thing because I really like it. It's very cool. Very, very cool. So um, anyways, yeah, the Thor 5 at Blade HQ. Okay. Um, let's see. Ah, uh, yes, so Troy said, it's a mystery wrapped in a riddle inside an enigma. 
that was the phrase that I was going for and completely screwed up. So, mm. are you getting the ZT606? I just wish they would do the pocket clip like the Sinkovich Rexford collab, the new ZT. Um, so I have the 606. If you mean the 609, then yes, I will be getting one. Yes, and that one's the last one to come out. So, so Chaz, this is the Reich uh, Thor Five that Blade HQ shoved in the Barney box. So, yes. All right. Um, okay. Mark also commented that his shuffler does not have any screws poking out. So if that was an issue on the round head, apparently they fixed it on the shuffler. And yes, man, they Lions still did a great job on these. I'm sure much much to uh, Dave's joy and dismay. Um, so it's not a frame lock though. So they got it very, very right. And then this, this spring here is like completely rounded. They rounded the spine too. I mean, there's definitely some nice details here. like. You know, you look at this versus like the Benchmade proper, and this is only like 10 bucks more than the proper, maybe $15 more. Um, <laughs> way more value in this one than like the Benchmade proper. But the interesting thing about the Benchmade proper is that knife is going to outsell this one like 100 to 1, um, which I find really fascinating as far as like how many are going to get into the hands of people, what are they going to do with it, you know, are they as a result going to buy more knives or become a knife enthusiast, so... Um, you know, this is, I mean, I had never even heard of Collector Knives, their website, uh, before this knife came out, and then I went and I signed up and I got all the notifications, so um, I'm sure this this specific knife in the round, it has sent a lot of traffic to, I mean, their website specifically, because um, I had no idea who they were before, so, yeah. Okay. Oh, Sean asks, now that you own a Sabenza, are you going to grab a real hinderer? Um, I'm not going to actively seek one out. If one comes in like a trade or something, then sure. But, um, I, I, he's getting closer. I mean, he's putting stainless steel lock inserts in on the Gen 5 stuff now, which is cool. Um, but, you know, the one thing that Hinder does that I still don't like is he puts, and it's not on this one, but he'll put jimping behind his flipper tabs which is like the cardinal sin for a flipper. Like, do not put any damn jimping behind a flipper tab because uh, it's super uncomfortable. Uh, as far as like some of the new stuff goes, where's this one? So this, um, I got this in this last week from Kaiser, and this is the Barbosa A2, one of their Vanguard series. But look at that jimping behind the flipper tab. This, oh, it's not comfortable. Um, and the knife's, I mean, the knife's well built, the knife's fine, it's got a really good action, but I just do not put, you know, this is a no-go. Um, you know, if you're going to open up your knife once a day and cut something, put it away, you're fine, but if you're going to kind of fidget with it or play with it, this gets real uncomfortable real quick. Um, so, yeah, that's something that Hinder does too that I don't like. But ZT does not do it, at least not on any of the new models, so, yeah. All right. Um, Benchmade doesn't sell to enthusiasts. Bad Rattle said, I don't know, man. The Benchmade Anthem, that is a straight enthusiast knife. Um, that's the one that, that made me kind of fall back in love with uh, Benchmade again. Um, of course, mine was perfect. It is perfect. Um, although I did upgrade the pocket clip, so there's that. But the Anthem is definitely an enthusiast knife. So, yeah. Um, all right. And it was next level. Um, okay, let's see here. Mine has no screws popping out. It's 609. Drake Dragonheart says the new Bumblebee has borne my speed. Apparently, they have a knife called the Bumblebee, too. I don't know. Um, again, I haven't really followed Reich too much just because I don't know. I feel like every time there's like a new model, it's already like discontinued or something. Um, but yes, I don't know. It's cool. All right, uh, so Chaz says his shuffler's spot on as well. Um, oh, Luke said his shuffler had to go back. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, 
Do you know if the previous, so for life, do you ask, do you know if the previous Thors had blades? Wait, do you know if like previous Thors, some blades had the cutout while some don't? Um, I'm not sure. Again, I don't really know much about, um, you know, Reich knife as a whole. Um, haven't, you know, haven't really followed them, so... I don't know. Maybe some won't have the cutout. Maybe some will. The, but then the question is, for the ones that don't have the cutout, do they optimize the pivot and the detent strength for a flipper only, or is it exactly the same as this one? Because if you know, if they take out the cutout and then they optimize the detent for a flipper only, that's great. But if it's just the exact same but it doesn't have the hole, then it's kind of pointless. And, you know, I, I think the cutout kind of makes this blade shape too. I don't know. Maybe I'm just so used to seeing it on like a Gavco that, you know, I prefer it with the cutout rather than not. Um, hard to say. So Dave said, Anthony Scolombrini had one of the hottest takes I've seen in a while in his roundhead review. I'll have to, I'll have to take a look at that. When, when Tony gets excited, sometimes he can be really funny. Okay. Any clue when the 609s will be dropping the ZT 609s? N no. If I had to guess, I would probably say the end of March would be my guess. Where in March? I'm going to guess maybe a month, but I reserve the right to be very wrong. Whoa, whoa. Okay, trying to catch up on the comments. Okay. Okay. So Hippie Knife Lover says, I hope Benchmade starts doing their access lock like they did for the Anthem with the uh, coil spring instead of the Omega spring. Um, I'd agree. I I'd love to see them implement that and bearings on a lot of the new Benchmade models. Um, I think that's the direction the brand needs to take if they care about the enthusiast market. Which they may, they might not. I mean, again, most of their bread and butter, I think, comes from brick and mortar stores. So it may not be worth their time to spend all that energy doing new models that are more difficult to do. Um, so you know, if they do, awesome. If they don't, you know, I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised. So, all right. Um, okay. Whoa, whoa. All right. Did you get in on the Bob Lum Tonto Blade HQ? Um, I did not, uh, you know, it looked like a really cool knife. I just, I haven't really done a lot of spider coats lately, even though the Paizan is going to be overpriced. I might pick one of those up because I think it would be valuable in a head to head against the custom knife factory Satori, which again, they're both integrals. They're both Peter Vicente collaborations. The question is who did it better and for what price? So, you know, again, I, I might pick up a Paizan regardless if the price is extravagant. So, Sean Ferrier, top blade steals for EDC, um, S35VN, CPM154, M390. Um, <clears throat> you know, those would be my top choices. Uh, you know, some of the other, like, you know, S110V or CPM10V or any of those crazy ones, they're not as necessarily rust resistant, so, you know, in terms of generalizing, I think those three steels are really good to go. A lot of people like VG10. I don't like having to sharpen it a ton, so not my favorite, but I get why a lot of people like it. I have not done the Insta questions yet. Um, I'll get to those in a second here. Okay. Um, oh, Terry Pucker. No, Perry Trucker. Wow, I got that way wrong. The Spidey Smock. Um... That one does interest me. I would feel comfortable buying a, smite, a spidey smock, but I would not feel comfortable buying a smocky smock. So, yes. All right. Um, so let me show you guys more of the new stuff because we're getting sidetracked here. So, yeah, there's this one, which is the Kaiser Barbosa A2, part of their Vanguard. Um, I also got in a few of the new Tangram series. So, Kaiser... Actually, okay, well, let's let's go through the lineup here. So, Vanguard. Uh, so, here we have Tangram, which is, you know, part of the new K 
Kaiser series, like which is the ultra budget stuff, because um, it uses what like Japanese Akuto, which is just a 440C, as far as I recall. Um, it's a 440 variant, but you know the Japanese, I guess, claim to do it better. I'm not too familiar with Akuto. I've never had a knife with it. But this is the ultra budget line, the Tangram. And then you have the Vanguard, which is VG10 and G10. And then you have the uh, Bladesmith series, I think. Damn. Which is, you know, like this Mat Matoza, someone, I don't know. Matanzas, something like that. I don't speak Spanish. Anyways, um, so here's the different levels of Kaiser knives. Um, I have to say, I'm actually really, really fond of this Tangram. It is a button lock. It's a really, really well executed button lock. And with the, what I guess is a hard anodized aluminum handle, it feels a lot like a Rockstead. Um, and it's also ridiculously smooth. So um, I don't, which model is this? There's the model number. That won't be at all helpful. Is there a model name? Oh, the Vector. So this Tangram Vector, um, if they are all as well executed as this one, I highly recommend it. It is, it's a really, really nice knife. Super smooth, excellent button lock. Um, not the best steel, of course, but you know, if it's like 30 or 40 bucks, I don't care. Um, but anyways, so that's part of the Tangram. I got a couple other ones, but I haven't even taken them out of the boxes yet. Um, let's see here. Okay. Colin asks if I've seen any knives from Enigma Knives. I have no idea who that even is. Or maybe I do and I can't remember. Either way. Uh, Drake Dragonheart said that means killing in Spanish or something. Yeah, it probably does. In Italian, it's what? Amazzare? Uccidere? Uccidere is to kill in Italian. Um, I think this means like massacre or something. I don't know. Anyways, um, the Nick Swan, the designer, said he designed this when he lived next to like Fort Matanzas or whatever. Um, I think in Florida. He gave the reason why he named it this, but um, it, it was based on like a, a fort or something. Um, anyways, it's nice. Um, I did disassemble and uh, clean it and then put in my lubricant of choice, which is just break-free CLP. It is not food safe, but it works really well on knives. So if you're using like in the pivot area and you've got a stainless steel lock insert, it's really good. Uh, that made this thing way, way smoother. Although they try to do like a low profile flipper tab. And as you guys have seen, I've slipped on it a bunch. So, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, you know, everything's give and take to an extent, so um, really nice slender design, though I'll, I'll do a video on this one soonish. I, I know I told someone I'd already have it up, but again, last week sucked, so that's just how it goes. Um, so, yeah, Chaz wants to know about the Perpetua. That is a great transition, Chaz. Uh, arc form. Thinking of getting the arc form instead of a Rockstead. Well, there's some huge price differences, Alex. Um, the arc form is really nice. Um, and, and the guy behind the company, I think he's a really good guy. Uh, Rocksteads are also really nice, though. So, ooh, that'd be a tough call. I mean, I think they're both really good knives. Um, man. That's a tough call. It's a good call, though, man. I mean, that's, that's my type of problem. Which knife should I get? Um, all right. Let me grab a couple more new knives to show you guys that are all sitting here on the floor. Um, so this one. Uh, this is that Mass Drop exclusive. I probably should have shipped it back to Mass Drop by now, but I've been lazy, and I have not minded having this thing around for a little bit longer. This is the uh, Prism from Tashi Barucha made by some manufacturer over, overseas in China. Um, I wonder who, if you watch my video, you should not be wondering anymore. So if you watched my video, it's not up to debate anymore. I gave you guys the freaking answer. So yes, you're welcome. It, it's not me guessing, it's me knowing. So uh, yeah. All right, so the Prism, 
really like it. All right, um, let's see. Aaron asked if I had a Reich 801. Nope, I had a Reich once upon a time. I think like the 1507, maybe? Yeah, 1507. It was cool. I liked it. Uh, yes, Chaz. Chaz is right. Everyone look at what Chaz wrote. Thank you, Chaz. Okay. Uh, the Master Op Perpetua and Nitro V. So, um, you know, manufactured by Millet, designed by my buddy T.J. Schwarz. Um, it does use a lock that is remarkably similar to the access lock, um, but cannot be called the access lock. So, yeah, I mean, you know, again, this is meant to be kind of like a, hey, I'm going to buy my first knife for over a hundred bucks. I want a really well-made knife. What should I get? Well, here's a great option for you. So, you know, kind of a, an everyday knife for people who are not necessarily knife people, um, but want to get their first nice knife. So... Uh, they did a lot of good here. USA made Nitro V Steel, which, yeah, man, some of the comments on Nitro V Steel, it's amazing when people don't know what the hell they're talking about, but they're so willing to share an opinion. God. Um, anyways. Mm. You know, assuming it performs similar to AEBL Steel, that's a great steel. Um, Gavco uses ABL, Jesse Jarrows uses AEBL steel. And I don't know if you guys have ever handled any Jarrows knives, but that guy makes knives to be beat to crap. Um, I have every confidence in Nitro V being a good steel and being super rust resistant for those who live in, you know, places like Florida where you just sweat on everything all freaking day. So anyways, that's the Perpetua. Mm hmm yeah, Chaz, steel snobs are the worst, but it's even worse when people pretend to be steel snobs and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Ignorant steel slobs. Ignorant steel snobs. Slobs. We'll call them slobs for short. Um, let's see. And then, so this one just came in today. This is the Hornet by VDK Knives. This is one of the prototypes. Um... So, I mean, I just pulled this one out of the mailbox not too long ago. So he's well known for the War Admiral, which is that big cleaver. The Pharaoh, which is an, a, a small little Persian. And then Pioneer of the Nile. So this one's kind of got basically the handle of the War Admiral plus the blade of the Pioneer of the Nile, if I had to kind of explain it. But um, some nice machining. Full backspacer. The uh, it's made by Wee Knives, of course, and the blade grind is pretty legit. I mean, that is a nice grind. I don't know if that had to if that was done by machine or hand, but it's clean, so clean. So, anyways, um, a fun one to to check out. So that's the Hornet. This is a prototype. Uh, I think he's doing like pre-orders for these now or something. But um, anyways, and it's got a nice usable finger trail up front for even large hands. So. Yes, that's another new one that came in. Um, all right. Hey, check out Brown Bear. Oh, okay, so Jovan Trujillo said, hey, check out Big Brown Bear. He has excellent info on Nitro V. I don't know if he's a form user or something, but yeah, I'm sure someone's done some adequate testing. I mean, in the wide world of knife enthusiasts, there are people who are very specific about the type of knife enthusiasts they are. Some of those guys really love testing steels, which... Spyderco does really well with like the Mule series where you get to just buy like a, a standard blank of steel and put whatever handles you want on it. I mean, that is such a fantastic concept. Um, I really respect the hell out of the Mule series. So, yeah. Um, oh, he's a YouTube channel, Halden said. Good guy, and apparently his name is Big Brown Bear. Okay. Cool. I'll have to Google that later. Um, and check out some Nitro V stuff. Um, so Jerry asked, I just got here, did you do a pocket dump? Yes, yes I did, Jerry. He's carrying some good shiz, um, as always, because I like fancy things. I'm a fancy man. Not really, but I like fancy, I like my knives, so. Anyways, um, what else? Oh, so I forgot to show this in the video of the Perpetua, but I put it in the, um, in the thumbnail, but here's the 3D print as they were working on the design, um, just to kind of see how the pieces fit together. I think the clip broke. 
But I don't know, I think this is fascinating to watch something go from, you know, a 2D design in CAD or SolidWorks or Fusion 360, and then they'll do like a 3D print, you know, which is like, I don't know, someone charges you 10 or 15 bucks for these things. Then you can get it in hand and see how it feels and kind of take a look at the proportions. And, you know, this is like the ultrasound of looking at your baby, right? And then the baby is born and you get to see what it's really like, what the weight's like, what the balance is like, you know, what tweaks do we need to make? So, um, I don't know. I, I find the design process fascinating and the reasons why. And um, I've, I've sat in on some design meetings where a knife company or um, designer is sitting there with their manufacturer and they're going over things on the knife. And um, the one I sat in on that I thought was really fascinating was a balisong. And so they had calipers and they were looking at like the measurements between the two handles and it was too close when it was closed. It needed to be a little bit further away. And, you know, this chamfer here and that chamfer there. I mean, the amount of detail is absolutely agonizing, um, which is why I always find it funny when people like say, oh, hey, this knife company, they they didn't do this or this was an oversight. And really, the answer is everything's done for a reason. With knife design, just like car design, there's give and take, there's price point considerations. Um, you know, on the Perpetua, I said, hey, you know what, it'd be really cool if you guys did like a, like a chamfer here um, on the G10 so that you have like a little ramp coming up to it. And, you know, the I was talking to, I think, TJ or maybe Jonas at Mastrop, and he's like, yeah, he's like, if we do that, that's going to increase the price significantly um, because it's, you know, it's just a whole nother manufacturing machining process and you have to set up a whole series to do it. And so, you know, and as soon as you increase prices on something like this, then it becomes less desirable for people. And so you've got all these crazy considerations aside of, you know, aside from can we just make an awesome knife, but... You know, how can we keep the price down? How can we give them the most bang for the buck? I mean, it's it's a very, very long and thoughtful process. And, uh, you know, it's, it's I don't know. It's interesting. I, I'd really like to see someday some knife company, like, record an, a knife design from start to finish. Like, the entire thing. You know, the the conversations they had, the the price points, you know, the, the specking, all this stuff to really let people understand what goes into it. I've been involved in a lot of those conversations through the designers or through a company over the years, but it's not something that enthusiasts get to really be a part of. So I think it really sheds light on what the process looks like and why companies have to make certain decisions that not everyone loves. So anyways, um, that's kind of my tangent. That's why, you know, shouldn't be so quick to judge on certain designs. Um, or throw people under the bus or say it was an oversight of those things because you really have no idea. So anyways, get off my soapbox. Uh, let me look at the comments. <laughs> so apparently Big Brown Bear is a budding knife maker. I will look him up. Um, also, E. Kim Knives, can't think of what his YouTube channel name is, but he's done some really cool stuff start to finish too. Um, I mean, that's as close to a documentary as, as we really get in the knife world, right? There's a lot of amazing documentaries about cars and watches and car races and designs and stuff, but um, YouTube is as close as we get in the knife world. So, you know, definitely check out some of those those channels, like apparently this Big Brown, Big Brown, like, what was it, Big Brown Bear Dude guy, Big, uh, yeah, whatever, check him out, and Ekim Knives too, so... Okay, um, oh, so Knife Nuts Dave said Brian uses Nitro V in the Arch Nemesis models that weren't damaged steel, so that will provide absolutely zero <laughs> usable data. <laughs> we should go to Brian and be like, Brian, what's good about Nitro V? Brian's response would be, shut up, don't bother me, my back is hurting, I hate life. Uh, so that's, um, Sharp by Design, Brian Dove, if you guys are wondering who we're referencing there. He is a delightful person from New Jersey, and everyone from New Jersey is, is exactly the same. So, um, so Perry Trucker asked if this one uses the Omega Spring, and the answer is yes. I mean, this is the exact same lock. Um, when Millet produced this, they... 
spoke to what McHenry and Williams, the designers of the access lock, um, about it and had them like look over it. And apparently like McHenry and Williams were like super helpful as they were working on like perfecting or developing this lock system. Um, you know, it now that now that Benchmade no longer has a patent on it, um, I don't think the designers McHenry and Williams will be getting the royalty checks anymore on the knives. So it's it's fair game at this point in the day as the designers apparently, and again, I'm putting words in a lot of people's mouths here, but I don't think that they're too concerned about other people using their lock at this point because the patent is up, the royalty checks are done. So I could be wrong. I reserve the right to be very wrong, but something along those lines and stuff and things and allegedly. It's thrown allegedly in there too. So... Okay. So. Yeah, Echo does knives. He's got a lot of Gavcos. He really likes the, the Nitro V and his Gavcos. And again, I've, I've had a really good experience with the Nitro V and my Gavcos. I've probably had, I don't know, maybe like six different Gavcos over the years. Um, never had a problem with them. And again, my Jesse Jero's that I still have has AEBL steel, which is again, very similar to Nitro V or whatnot. And um, actually all my Gavcos had AEBL. Anyways, it's a good steel. I have no problems. People get caught up in the act, too caught up in the discussion and they don't really put anything into the actual use. Again, there are a lot of people like VG10 and I think VG10 is like, I mean, it's a good steel, but you have to sharpen the damn thing all the time. So, yeah. All right, Sean's asking questions that he asked me on Instagram. I will get to those in a second, Sean. Fear not, you had a lot of freaking good questions. You are a question machine. Um, <laughs> so, Jovan Trujillo says, talking about the Rockwell hardness on the Nitro V. Um, again, guys, when you're looking at making a knife that is usable or the most versatile knife possible for the greatest population, you can't throw on a steel with like a really hard Rockwell because no one will be able to sharpen it. I mean, it's again, the same kind of discussion around why Chris Reeve initially went a little bit softer on the S35VN um, on the Sabenza and it's because it's less likely to chip at that point and it's easier to sharpen. And when you have guys who aren't, you know, knife enthusiasts or sharpening aficionados, I mean, they're just going to struggle and send it in for warranty work or repair because they can't sharpen the knife. So again, when you're looking at generalizing a, a knife or a steel or performance or all those things to make it as usable for everyone, you're not looking to optimize anything specifically. You want to make it as versatile as possible. So, you know, again, it's buy what you'd like, um, you know, vote with your wallet. But that's the reason why they went with that. Rockwell hardness, um, in my opinion. So I think there's there's a fairly long discussion on the the master drop discussion page about it. So um, and I think Millet may or may not have weighed in or will weigh in at some point on it. But yeah. Um, so hippie knife lover says, do you have any fixed blades in your collection? Um, yes, I have two. I have a custom Gavco fixed blade, a small little EDC knife, and then I have a zero tolerance one eighty fixed blade. And those are the only two fixed blades I have, and in reality, I've never carried either. But I have them just in case. You know, those are my just in case knives, just in case I need to go out on a, I don't know, do something outdoorsy with like trees and shit, to paraphrase <laughs> Knife Nuts Dave. Um, what do you call it? Tree shit? If you're doing tree shit, uh, that's what my ZT180 is for. And then, you know, my little fixed blade, my little Gavco, it was actually a gift from someone, which was um, an incredible gift. And so that'll always stay with stay with me. Um, one of my friends locally, uh, Dave Brown, he, of, uh, he makes Kydex holsters and sheaths and stuff. He does all the bussy stuff. I mean, if I really wanted to get, like, some more fixed blades, I'd get some bussies and I'd have Dave Brown, like, steer me in the right direction because that guy knows everything about bussy and fixed blades and he makes sheaths for everything he's a good dude so if you guys need sheath work um go to oh crap what is his instagram i'm a terrible person dave brown what is his instagram instagram brown ink mm. by brown industries yeah so there's my buddy dave Bur uh Dave Brown, he does, you know, all the bussy stuff. 
So you guys can hit him up and do fixed blade things with him. I don't know. Yes. Okay. John says, if you haven't mentioned, have you handled a ZT393 like this one? Yes, yes, I have handled it. Uh, for the, I've been carrying this one for the last two days. I really like it. I'm really trying to wrap my head around it though because the original 0392 is arguably my favorite production knife ever produced. And so I'm really trying to wrap my head around how I feel about this one considering it's going up against my favorite knife ever made um, as a substitute. So I'm really going to have to think about this one before I do the video. Like I really like it, but how much do I like it? Where's the price point come in? Like is it worth it? Maybe it's a moot point since you can't buy the 0392 anyway. And no, I will not sell any of you, any of my 0392s. Do not ask. It's like the number one knife I get head up for and it's my favorite knife. No. If my house burns down, keep in the damn knives. Sell my clothes, walk around naked. Mm. All right. What is the most corrosion resistant stainless steel? Yep, H1, probably. Um... John asked, any reason to keep an 0392 aside from rarity? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an incredible knife. And it just, especially like the original one, it, it, feels, it feels bulletproof, right? It just, like, I have complete and absolute trust in the knife that it's always going to work. <clears throat> Ergonomics are amazing, has incredible action locks up like a freaking bank fall. I mean, I just, I trust that knife beyond comparison. It's, you know, it's like, why do people buy a Rolex? Because they think it's going to last forever, right? If they fall, jump out of a plane or something, you know, the Rolex is going to survive. I mean, that's, I don't know. There's, there's something about believing that something is indestructible that makes it, I need to think about this more. I'm not, I'm not really explaining this well right now, but I don't know. There's just there's some sense of indestructibility with the original 0392, the one's completely stonewashed. Um, and for some reason that makes me love it beyond what is rational. So yes. All right. Uh, let me get to some of the questions because there were some good questions that were asked. Uh, let's go here. Okay. Good question. Lots of questions. Holy crap. Questions. Uh, I'm not naked, Vitasse, but I might take off my pants. So, um, top 10 knives currently in the collection. Oh, man. I mean, I have like more than 10 customs, and with the price they cost, I better love them if I'm keeping them around. So, any from my Clyde Chalinors, uh, my Sam Johnston Navaja, anything from, um, Oh, uh, guys, why can't I remember names? Every time I'm live streaming, I suck at names. Um, Shane Atwood of Utah. I love his stuff. I love my ZTs. Uh, I might have to, like, make a top 10 video. But the problem is, like, I'm going to end up just picking, like, one knife from each of my favorite company, right? So I don't know if it's going to be a true top 10 because uh, I just don't know if I can pick 10. I don't know. I have trouble picking one. What are your knife guilty pleasures? You know, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Crap like this purple skull. I mean, you know, this is this knife is a guilty pleasure. There's no question about it. Um, the, the steel flame jewelry stuff is definitely a guilty pleasure, right? Um, just stuff like that. It's like you shouldn't like it, but you absolutely do. Um, yeah, this, this is a guilty pleasure knife for sure. So that was from Any Fresh Six. Uh, brown knives, front flipper, stronger, weak detent. It's got to be medium. Front flippers are really hard to do well, and button locks are really hard to do well. Um, but it's got to be a medium detent. We've talked to. What's your take on. Oh, Drake. I think that's Drake Dragonheart in here. Um, what's your take on Vero? I hope it dies. I hope it dies because I don't need any other freaking social media stuff that I have to keep track of. It is hard enough with Instagram and YouTube. I, I just don't want more crap to keep track of. So I hope Vero dies. Um, and I hope that Instagram gets their crap together, realizes why people are leaving and fixes freaking Instagram. Those 
SOBs. How do you maintain and sharpen your knives? Um, I strop my stuff. I have a lot of knives and I rotate through them. I carry a different knife every day because I can and it makes me happy. And so stropping is adequate. If I have to sharpen, I, <laughs> I make someone else do it. Um, it's because sharpening is not my thing. You know, people, there are different ways to enjoy knives. Some people it's tinkering and sharpening and modifying and I'm not one of those people. Um, what is your biggest knife purchase regret? I know I took a really big bath on something, but I bought a Quartermaster once. I felt so dirty. I didn't even do a video, and then I just got rid of it. So that that was that. Mm. I've handled the Benchmade Ruckus and Small. Um, great designs. You know, Benchmade has a lot of staples, and that's certainly one of them. Jake wants to know what I do for a living. I work in finance, and... Yes, I am. I can't state the company, but I work in finance and I'm technically a financial advisor. So, um, Mark's gonna wear his tinfoil hat. So here's Sean. I know Sean's watching. Um, he had a lot of good questions. Uh, so, favorite current ZT models not designed by Hinderer. That was sneaky, Sean, because I was going to pick the 0392 and then the 0562, but you've taken both of those away from me. So I'm going to say my new favorite ZT that is not a Hinder model is the 0462 because it is a Persian and it is clean and it's a Sinkovich and daddy-like. So where do you believe the sweet spot is for production knife pricing? Uh, 250. 250 or below is the sweet spot. Sean's next question. Best 300 all around are made in America? I'm going to drop to 250 and just say the ZT0562. Um, okay. What are your thoughts on bearings riding directly on tie scales? So um, I had a conversation with Clyde Chalinor. Let me, let me grab one. Hold on. I'm trying not to bump the camera. Oh. Okay. So let's, let's pull up some Clyde Chalinor goodness. This is the Talon, uh, Damasteel, Timascus, Shipriti, and this is the Raptor 2 Reverse Tonto. So Clyde has his, um, I think these are ceramic. Yeah, these are ceramic because I upgraded them, or he, he gave me bearings to upgrade. But Clyde runs the bearings directly on the titanium. And what he does is he takes, I don't want to cut myself. He takes the... You know, he takes the knife and he takes the bearings and he puts it in between the titanium and then he sandwiches it in a vise and he compresses the crap out of the vise and then he rotates the, the blade or the bearings or whatever to preform a track in the titanium. Now, according to his measurements, and, and I, I, there was another knife maker I talked to about this, the titanium will compress by one millimeter um, over time you know, or under pressure and then it hits and guys, I'm not an engineer. So let's, let's not quote me and share this elsewhere, but basically the titanium because of the grain structure can only compress a certain amount based on the bearing size. So one millimeter is max compression for the size of bearings, you know, normal size bearings. And so when you preform that track, um, the, the titanium will not compress further, and so it's not necessary to go in and put in a stainless steel track or racer. Um, but, you know, again, that's that's a lot of hand work by preforming, you know, cold, um, the bearing track in the titanium. So if you don't do that, in theory, the titanium could compress on its own over time. And if the design was, you know, designed in mind that you'd have to tighten it, which I don't really know that there's a good way to do that, it should be fine, but in reality, it, it's probably not. So either you need the stainless steel um, washers or racers in there or do what he does and you need to go in and preform cold roll the titanium to compress it as much as it's going to compress and then, again, you don't have to worry about it. So um, that is my thoughts from, again, I mean, Clyde is a fantastic knife maker, so I certainly trust his opinion. His quality is second to none. So that's my thoughts on your question, Sean, which hopefully I answered, which was, 
uh, your thoughts on bearings running directly on tight scale. So that's my thoughts. Either you're going to have to go in and do some preforming or you need stainless steel bearings. Current favorite knife. Oh, again, I think we're going back to the ZTO392, um, but I have a lot of knives that I love almost as much as that one. So, you know, it's hard to pick a favorite child. Current favorite knife maker, custom or production? Uh, custom knife maker. Uh, Craig Brown is amazing. Clyde Chalinor is amazing. Um, I think Jason Guthrie is an amazing custom maker. Uh, Sergey Rogovitz of Extreme Addiction. I think he does incredible work too. So I don't have a fair bit. I mean, I like them all for different reasons. So those are some of my favorite. And mid -techs, worth it. No, mid -techs are bullshit. Um, you need to know what you're buying. You need to know how much hand time went into it. What, even if the, even if the custom maker does touch it over a production knife, what are they offering? Like, what is it that they're doing that makes it better? If it's just quality control, I'm not paying a few hundred extra bucks for that. You know, if, if they're going through and they're sharpening and there's a lot of handwork and I value their time, which I would, then sure. But if it's just a QC, hey, look, the knife works. Honestly, you could hire me to do that, and I would do just as good of a job in theory. I couldn't fix anything, but I could tell you if, hey, this one passes or not. So, you know, again, you got to know what you're buying. There needs to be something. If it's going to be a couple hundred bucks more than a production knife alternative, there better be something freaking amazing about it. Um, just the fact that someone touched it does not do it for me. So I'm I'm done. I'm over. Again, mid-tech can mean so many things. It could mean nothing just you know exactly what you're buying and why you're paying the price that you're paying. So, yes. All right, let me go back to the comments. <laughs> okay, Kirby the house cat, what do you use to sharpen your knives? Uh, my friend Nick, I, <laughs> I, make, I make him do it. Uh, again, I'll strop, but if it's going to need a, a more intensive sharpening job, I'll, I'll make Nick do it because Nick is good at that stuff. So, uh not ten. did you miss the Barney content? You did. The Thor 5 by Reich Knives with the guilty pleasure on the bottom. That didn't sound right. That didn't sound right. Okay. Uh, do you still like your Guardian Tactical Nano, your Guardian Tactical Helix, uh, Moto Noob 808 asked? Yes, I have two Guardian Tactical Helix Nanos, and then I have my Guardian Tactical... Konix that just came back. I let a friend borrow it. I love Guardian Tactical. They're not cheap, but they're an underrated U.S. knife maker, definitely. Ooh, any new integrals besides Spyderco? Uh, Jovan asks, yes. The Custom Knife Factory Satori. I'm building that thing up in my mind like nobody's business. If I am disappointed, it'll be because I have built it to a status that is just unattainable for current production methods. Uh, Richard, do you think ZT makes a better hinderer than hinderer? No question. No question. Chaz, you sold my fave, the Shiro. Chaz, I sold my fave, the Shiro. But when someone offers you that much money, I mean, I only have so much willpower. But I do hate myself for it. I, I absolutely hate myself for it. I actually recorded a video of the Shiro before I sold it. But I hate myself so much for selling it that I have not actually made that Shiro video live because I am ashamed of myself. I shit you not. <laughs> the video's on YouTube. I just, I, I have not made it live. It's still marked as private. I just don't know if I want to. All right. Um, Bill Von Hoy, what do you think of the G10 overlay? Uh, Bill, I'll need to, oh, you must mean on this one. At first I wasn't sure but it's actually fairly grippy, and what it does is it gives a knife that is a flat titanium scale. And again, flat scales are not the most comfortable. What it does is it gives it more of a contoured feel in the hand um, because of that G10 overlay. Um, so it makes the knife more comfortable and it adds grip. So, you know, aesthetically it's not the most exciting, um, but functionally it adds value to it. I would like this more if it was like carbon fiber, which I don't know. I'm kind of done modding knives. I've burnt so much money doing it. 
but this would look really nice with like a carbon fiber overlay and then like the hinder hardware. Um, but then once you start throwing that much money at it, at that point you might as well just buy the original 0392 or one of the variants of the 0392 series. And so, you know, uh, I think it's fine. I would just leave it as it is and just beat the snot out of, the, out of this knife. Um, it's awesome. So that's what I think of the G10 overlay. It Plus, you know, as you can see, that hex bolt here is uh, inset into the G10, which keeps it from moving. So this is um, integral to the construction or the design of the knife. So it's not like you can just take it off, you know. Um, but again, you might, th there's going to, you know, there are aftermarket, you can get hinder clips, you can get hinder um, pivots, you can get hinder filler tabs. I don't know if you guys know Dr. Frunky, um, but he already upgraded his knife and he posted a video of all the upgrades that he did. Um, the pivot doesn't sit completely flush with the hinder hardware, but um, I'm sure there's going to be some knife modders who do like carbon fiber and some different backspacers. Um, there's a pretty decent aftermarket support network for a lot of designs these days, which is cool if you want to throw money at it. I'm kind of done throwing money at modding production knives, but you know, that's just me. Okay. Um, okay, bad rattle sharpening his Curtis F3 large while I'm streaming. That's a good choice. Uh, okay, Ozarks, aren't those those crappy Walmart knives that people got all excited about? Um, probably. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, oh. Okay, dude. Sometimes this this comments thing just like jumps like crazy, and I have to go try to find it. Luke mentioned that he loves his Clyde Chalinors. Luke, you have good taste, my friend. And Clyde's the nicest guy too. If you if you go to a knife show, go up and talk to Clyde. You'll well, don't you'll like him so much you'll buy a knife from him just because you like him. So, um. So Brandon was just saying he will stop asking about the ruckus. Um, it's one of his unicorn knives. I respect that, man. You know, they're just knives that we saw and we fell in love with and they push us towards knives, but we still don't own it. Do you chase that down? I mean, that, that's a beautiful pipe dream, so. Uh, what about dry lube versus nano oil? Um, I use break-free CLP. It's not food safe. It's like highly toxic, but it's always worked well for me. I've tried some dry lubes. Uh, I've tried nano oil. It just wasn't really a impressed it didn't do any it, it did not perform as well as the clp for my use so to use your knives for food kirby the house can't ask no i have kitchen knives they work a lot better and they're a lot easier to clean so you don't get crap in the pivot so ooh, ryan i think it's possible the cfk satori the custom knife factory satori ends up being cheaper than the spider co pizan I'd agree. I, I think that would be a smart move on Custom Knife Factory's part if they priced it lower than the Paizan because then everyone would get the Satori in lieu of the Paizan and that would be smart. Shotgun Bowen, how much money do you think you have tied up in your knives? Uh, I did the math once. It was a while ago. I was not necessarily proud of myself, um, but it's a lot. Now the thing is, my collection is a joke compared to some people's collections. I have heard and seen pictures of half a million dollar collections, right? And that's not even getting into art knives. So, you know, the tens of thousands that I have in mine is honestly a joke compared to some. But, you know, it's about enjoying what you have and it's definitely not about the money. So buy what you like, buy what you can afford and enjoy it and appreciate things that you can't afford, but don't covet them or waste your energy being mad about it. So, um, <laughs> knife with the best flipper action. Uh, Oh, I actually, well, I'll show you. I'll show you. Hold on. Give me, let me grab it. All right, so the knife with the best action in my collection, um, and I haven't done a video on this one yet. Uh, I will at some point, but I'm going to say that it is the Peter Carey 5050 Nitro. Oh, yes. It is really, really good. So just ex explosive and violent and smooth. 
And the thing that really impressed me is I had three of these side by side at one of the USN shows a couple years ago, and every single one had absolutely identical action, all absolutely perfect. Um, and then that set off what was a, you know, a two year, not really a hunt, but a, a, I coveted this knife for a couple of years. I, I didn't actively seek one out because I didn't want to pay double table price because I don't pay secondary prices because I don't make that much money. But um, I had a friend offer this one to me to a price that was fair and yes. So I'm going to say this is the best flipper in my collection and possibly the best I've ever handled. So whoop, I slipped. Anyways, it's, it's just, yeah. Do you guys want to know what's kind of funny about this one? So this is a T40 Torx, and I do not have any T40 Torx. And so I asked Peter, I'm like, hey, what's the Torx size? He told me T40. I ordered a, a T40 Torx, and then it got here, and I didn't think about it because Amazon makes ordering crap really easy. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to take it apart and, you know, lubricate, clean the knife. And then I was like, Oh, damn it, I need two. <laughs> so I've only got one T40 Torx right now, and I need two to take the knife down. And again, I'll jump on Amazon and order a second one at some point, but I just was so depressed that I was a moron that I just haven't gotten back to it. So um, so this is the Peter Carey Nitro 5050. Um, no, you cannot buy it. Now you know, Jovan. Uh, not when beverage this evening is this. I don't intend to live past my 60s. Mm. Okay. Anyways, so I think let me check, make sure there, see if there are any more questions. Uh, we covered a lot of stuff today. There were a lot of knives on the table, and uh, thanks to Blade HQ for dropping this lovely guilty pleasure in the Barney box this week. Um, yeah, I don't know who picked this one this week, but oh gosh, you guys are good. You know what tickles my fancy, so. Um, oh, okay, so there were a few more questions. Uh, okay. Um, next knife fiddle faddle prediction. I mean, I think, I think we're kind of heading towards it, which is, um, I mean, eventually we're going to be moving away from frame locks and, you know, perhaps we're going to see more you know, button locks, um, more, you know, front flippers, um, you know, more slip joints, uh, certainly, uh, which we're already starting to see. But I think that pace is probably going to pick up a little bit more, um, you know, like the, the mass drop gent, little tiny thing. I mean, that knife sold crazy well. People love it. So I don't know more of that, I, I suppose. But, you know, even like uh, ZT, you know, um, it's still a large knife, but look how slender and lightweight and slim uh, this thing is. I mean, it still has, you know, all the strength of a frame lock, um, but it's just it's just more practical, more usable. You know, the, the blade stock thickness, you know, we're moving away from the ZT300 and 200s, you know, as a whole, and we're moving into more of, you know, practical. And, you know, again, you guys might look at this and think it's not practical, but it carries very well. It's slender. It's long. It's lightweight. You know, is this the best knife if you're a preschool teacher? Probably not, but I'm not a preschool teacher. And so this is an awesome knife. So yes. Um, other than that, you know, it, one thing that's kind of an interesting change as a whole is that we are moving away from the time that you had to you know, if you wanted a knife made or a knife design, you had to approach a large company like Spyderco or CRKT or those things. There's a lot more people with CNC machines in their garages. Um, you know, there's a lot more people. You can go to Wee Knives now and you can have your design made. Um, you know, like this Wasp from VDK. And so eventually we're going to just see more smaller runs, niche brands. Um, I think we're going to move away from, you know, the mass industrial machines that were production knives of the past. So, you know, we might come to the point where people are doing runs of, you know, 50 knives instead of 100 knives, and there's just a lot more runs being done, and it's more of a niche market. Um, I think we're going to see more of that. We're going to see more people making knives in their garage using CNCs. 
um, just smaller microchasms of knife making um, instead of the large industrial machine that it has been since the 80s. So that's my prediction. What that means beyond that, it's it's hard to say. Um, that would be a good, I don't know, uh, another topic for discussion at, a, at another time of, you know, what that might look like. But, you know, again, you know, Brian Addo and Craig Brown and the, the Grimsmo brothers, um, even though the Grimsmo brothers, they make a crap ton of knives, you know, and they have made the same model for a long, long time now, but less of that smaller runs, runs of 50 instead of a hundred back in the day, it used to be runs of 500 before that maybe runs of a thousand. So just more designs, more often smaller runs, um, which again has its pros and cons definitely. Um, so anyways, those are some of my thoughts on what, you know, what's going to happen. Um, you know, filmmaking is, is kind of going to take the same change. You're going to see more people producing their own movies using, you know, cell phones and just video editing software instead of the mass monster that is Hollywood. So um, as technology improves and people are more competent, um, enthusiasts can start to do more things without help from industrial empires, essentially. So, yep, yep, yep. All right. Uh, any last minute things before we end this? Um, <laughs> Did I like the Tangram? Yes, yes, I did. I th I thought this was a really nice little knife, um, you know, for the price point that they're asking. The button lock is executed better than. Well, I had a Brian Ty custom with a button lock, and this button lock is better um, executed than the one I had there. Um, this is one of the best button locks I've ever experienced, which is kind of odd on like this cheap Chinese made knife. Um, yeah. Uh, Kaiser, if you watch this, which I don't think you will, or if you understand this, um, make me a larger version of this, and let's use S35VN, and I will be a freaking happy camper, because uh, this is nice. This is very nice. So, anyways, uh, any more things, stuff and things, stuff and things? <laughs> okay. Do I think Benchmade is improving their quality? Hard to say. They make so many knives. Um, the sample sizes you'd have to look at from a statistical standpoint would be enormous. Um, I hope so, uh, because they have, you know, they have so much potential. Um, I, I hope that they're improving. ZT friction folder would be the most ridiculous thing to ever happen. Shotgun Bowen said, I wouldn't put it past them. You know, everyone wants to say that ZT is about making overbuilt, hard used knives, but I would say ZT is about being cutting edge um, from design and, uh, you know, technical standpoint. So I would not put a, a slip joint or a friction folder past them. Um, it's just a question of when. So, okay. All right. So that. I mean, that's pretty much it. We've been streaming for, what, an hour and a half now? So um, I, I think we'll call it good there. Um, really appreciate all you guys tuning in. I mean, that's awesome questions, awesome feedback. Hopefully you guys don't feel like you wasted an hour and a half this evening. Or for those who tuned in at the very end, what, three or four minutes were not wasted. So, yep, we will leave it there. I'm going to – I'll do another live stream in two weeks. I'm, I'm going to try not to be a lazy A and, you know, push it off till three weeks again. So, Yep, yep, yep. Thanks for watching. Again, the Blade HQ knife was the Thor 5 from Reich, and you can head over there. Here is the item number if you want to take a peek at this thing. And um, if you guys want to buy me something nice, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't be mad. I wouldn't be mad. So, anyways, thanks again, guys. You have a wonderful night and hopefully a good weekend because tomorrow is Friday and we need more weekends in our life. So... Take care, guys. See ya.